Well, this morning we are talking about women uh, and God using women. But before we talk about God using women, I just want to start with kind of what we see in our world today when it comes uh, to women. And the obvious observation is that women in our world today, in the 21st century, still suffer uh, injustices and oppression. A number of examples that we could uh, refer to uh, there, uh, because of selective abortions, uh, many young girls are denied life in many countries. Uh, There are honor killings that take place where women are losing their life uh, because of a certain belief. There are women that are being um, uh, uh, kidnapped and uh, brought into the sex trade, uh, into sex trafficking, and others into human trafficking. And you just look at our world, and uh, women are not treated as equal. Uh, Many people see women as servants to men, uh, many people see women as uh, to be controlled by men. And uh, you hear in our, in our world today, voices maybe current way over here, who, uh, voices of people who are misogynists and uh, in particular places, particular groups, and who just they hate women. And then over here you have women who are responding in a, in a, in a radical way uh, uh, that in a sense trying to condemn men in general, that in a sense almost hate men and don't recognize God's design for males and females. Uh, We, as the body of Christ, we, in relationship to the God who created us, are to be a light in this world. And as we read in Scripture, God created all things. He created the heavens and the earth, and the pinnacle of his creation uh, was human beings. And he made us male and female in his image, and we are equal in position. I never ask for an amen in church, but any ladies that want to say amen, go amen. Yes, you're equal in position. That women are not to be defrauded or dismissed or devalued or controlled or to be a servant to men. They are to be valued. They are equal in position because God created them in his image. But they are also equal, and this is what we want to focus on this morning, in gifting. God's plan all along has been that men and women, male and female, together side by side as his representatives, reign and rule over his creation. And so women are called to serve God with their gifts just like Men. And so as we begin this morning, I want to ask all of the ladies here, women, speaking to you, men, you can listen in as well, but do you know that you are called by God to serve him with your gifts? Do you know that? Do you know that you have a purpose in life, that you have a calling in life? You're not simply to be passive or aimless, but God has gifted you, and you are to use those gifts Uh, to for his glory and I just want to say right off the bat at Woodside we want to value women but I'll tell you we also need women and the gifts of women in this church again another amen from the ladies okay let's move on what we're going to do today we're going to look at scripture starting in the beginning and we're going to look at the the Old Testament period and for those of you that are new to the Bible that's the period before Jesus and we're looking at look at going to look at a few examples of how God used women. We're going to move to the time of Christ and see how he not only elevated women, women, but he empowered them. Then we're going to move to the early church and look at how those first followers of Jesus, how they uh, were used of God, many women then there. And then we'll end up at Woodside here today and how God uses women uh, here today. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to be looking at a number of passages. The first one is, is in Exodus 15. Exodus 15. So we're starting in the Old Testament. And in Exodus 15, verse 20, it describes Miriam as a prophet. And just like other Old Testament prophets, a prophet spoke for God. So Miriam spoke for God. Miriam uh, had two brothers, Moses and Aaron, Aaron. And Miriam served alongside of her brothers uh, during the Israelite exodus from Egypt. So we see Miriam, uh, in some ways, uh, as a leader. Uh, The next example is found in Judges 4. And in Judges 4 and 5, we read the story of Deborah. And listen to what we read in verse 4 of chapter 4. Now, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. 
And if you read the story of Deborah, she is a prophet, she is a leader, she's actually the judge over Israel. People came to her for counsel. She's also a singer, and we believe from the song, I think it's in chapter 5 of Judges, that it's, it, many uh, tradition has it that she was a songwriter, that she wrote it. She was a very gifted woman, a woman in leadership as well. And then when we uh, turn to the book of Esther, we see another woman who is a leader. And for those of you that don't know the story of Esther, she was a Jew, and during the exile, when many of the Jews were exiled out of Israel, the land of Israel, into uh, the, to the east, in particular to Persia, uh, she, she found herself in Persia, which is uh, the area of modern-day Iran. And there, she rose to the position of queen. And uh, Mordecai, her relative, um, poses this question to her, a very familiar question, and he says, and who knows but that you, Esther, have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Uh, Esther, you're in a high position. You might be able to affect things, and you need to do it for good. And she actually uh, was used by God and saved many Jewish lives. Now, when we look at the Old Testament, we see women like Miriam and Deborah and Esther who had some leadership abilities who were uh, in that position. But in the Old Testament, we also see women who didn't have leadership abilities, but God used them just as much. And we can talk about Hannah and Abigail and Ruth and many others. So what we see in the Old Testament prior to the time of Jesus is God using women. Now we come to the time of Jesus. So from the ancient Near Eastern world, as time progresses, we come to the Greco-Roman world. And in that day, in the Greco-Roman world, similar to the ancient Near East, women weren't valued. And here's the reality that, Jesus, uh, that was around Jesus at the time. And we really need to understand the context to, to understand how shocking Jesus' words and actions were when it came to women, how revolutionary they were. I'm going to uh, refer to three particular stories. But just to give you a little context, here's the Jesus world. Uh, just after the time of Jesus, there's the Jewish historian, uh, Josephus, who is very famous. Many of you have read his works at school. But Josephus said, writing about that time, he said that all women in all ways are inferior to men. Anybody want to give an amen to Josephus? Women in all ways are inferior to men. Many of the male Jews at that time, not, not, again, uh, many others as well, but they started a prayer, daily prayer, uh, mostly the religious leaders, but many males as well, started a daily prayer that went something like this, God, thank you for not making me a woman. A particular rabbi at the time of Jesus um, made a quote to this effect. Who's, he said that the law or the Torah, uh, it's better for the law or the Torah to be burned than to give it to a woman. Okay? So at that time, women um, were not respected. They, they were not equal. They didn't have access to education. If you had a ladder of society, men were up here, animals were here, slaves were here, and women were here. That's the reality that Jesus uh, found himself in. Now look at these three stories in light of that. Uh, the first one is in Luke 13. And here, Jesus is in a synagogue. And uh, in the synagogue, in full view of everyone, he heals a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. She had been bent over, and he heals the woman. And typically when we read that, we're, 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 we're seeing the the um, opposition from the synagogue leader or the religious leaders about, who, about what can and cannot be done on the Sabbath. Like, who has authority to say what can be done on the Sabbath? But don't miss this. Don't skip over what Jesus calls this lady that he just healed. In verse 16, he's, he says this, Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? And Jesus is teaching them, it is good, a good thing, a right thing to do good on the Sabbath. But notice he calls this woman a daughter of Abraham. That would have been the first time that that was heard. Nobody was called a daughter of Abraham. You heard of someone being called a son of Abraham, that in God's plan, which came through Abraham, men were named, they were sons of Abraham, 
but you would never hear of the daughter of Abraham. And so Jesus here is lifting up women, but he's also including women in the story of God. They've got a part to play. And uh, just an amazing, amazing thing that Jesus did. A second story is found in Luke chapter 10, and many of us are familiar with this story. Jesus did his ministry when he was in the uh, north. He used Capernaum as his home base, but when he was in the south, uh, in Jerusalem, just east of Jerusalem, his home base kind of was Bethany, at the, at the home of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And they are there on a particular occasion, Luke records for us, and Mary, uh, Martha rather, is in the kitchen kind of preparing stuff for Jesus and the disciples, but where is Mary? And don't miss this. Verse Verse 39, Luke records for us. She, or Martha, had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Mary wasn't in the kitchen. Mary was listening to Jesus teach. And what is so incredible about that is that women were not to be taught like that. You didn't teach a woman. And Mary is there right among the guys, learning from Jesus. And, of course, Martha comes out and, and demands, that, or, you know, Jesus, tell her to get in the kitchen with me. I'm just, this is uh, making a projection here, but maybe Martha thought in her mind, Mary, I not only need your help, but your place is in the kitchen with me. Like, that's a woman's role. You need to be in the kitchen with me. And Jesus says to Martha, Martha, you know, you're distracted about many things, but Mary has chosen the better thing, and that will not be taken away from her. And so Jesus is teaching Mary. And again, I like to think that Jesus said once he was done teaching, okay, Mary, let's all go kind of help out in the kitchen, right? But don't skip over that. Jesus, in his parables, included women as characters again and again. The woman in the lost coin, the bridesmaids, the widow, and the unjust judge. Jesus spoke to women. And then a third uh, thing that Luke records for us, Luke uh, chapter 8, he records that as Jesus is traveling, he's traveling with his disciples, but he's also traveling with women, which rabbis didn't do in that day. But notice how God used these women. Verse 3, we read these words, these women were helping to support them out of their own means, that God was using these women to help finance the ministry of Jesus. So when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and you read the story of Jesus, again and again you find women, and you find Jesus affirming them, valuing them, but also empowering them. Who was the first person in the Gospels, first person, that Jesus went public with the truth that he was the Messiah? It was a woman, the woman at the well. It's interesting, this woman at the well, when it came to the ladder, she was kind of below women because she was a woman uh, who had a past and probably had like next to nothing when it came to education. But here's Jesus not only revealing the, that he's the Messiah to her, but he's engaging her in a theological discussion. I mean, no rabbi would ever do that. He's actually treating her like a person and that she matters and he's teaching her. And in fact, she comes to, to a, a, the saving knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah and she's the first evangelist. She goes and tells the folks in her village, come and see this guy, come and see Jesus. Uh, another question, who was the first person that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection? It was a woman, Mary Magdalene, right? And so we see women all through the story of Jesus. So for all of you ladies today, um, please hear this. Jesus loves you. And Jesus, when you want to know how he treats you or would treat you, you just look at how he treated women. And we see in his story that he treated women as equals to the men around him. He listened to women. He did not belittle women. He honored women. He challenged women. He taught women. He included women. He did not patronize women. He did not condescend to women. But yet, too, he shared with women that they, just like men, needed forgiveness, needed redemption. So women are highly, highly valued 
by Jesus. When we see the early church then, we continue to move. In the early church, it's not surprising that after Jesus ascended and those first followers are waiting for the Holy Spirit uh, to come, what we refer to as Pentecost, that in an upper room together there were men and women. And as you read through the book of Acts, again, you will see God using women. Let me give you a few examples. The church of Ephesus, Timothy is the pastor But at the church of Ephesus, they probably didn't attend this church, but God used them to help this church, was Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. Because they, when Timothy uh, was younger in the home, they shaped him in God's word. And God used them to build into Timothy. And so God used them in a way at the church of Ephesus. When we look at the church at Philippi, uh, God used a lady in particular called Lydia, who was a businesswoman. And she, like some other ladies, would go down to the, to the water on the Sabbath, and there Paul spoke the gospel to them, and she gets, uh, make, gets saved and baptized. And then the, the church at Philippi begins to meet in her home. And then later on, when Paul's doing his missionary journeys, the church of Philippi, including Lydia, supported Paul in his ministry. So God used Lydia in the church of Philippi. And in the church of Rome, Paul lists for us a number of women that God used. Let me just quickly run through some of them. Uh, We read in in Romans 16 and verse 1, Paul says to the church at Rome, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church and Sincrea. So welcome her because God's using her at this other church. Then in verse 3, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. We know Priscilla and Aquila as a power couple. But what's interesting, uh, uh, Priscilla's name is mentioned first, which is uncommon. You typically didn't do that. I think Paul's trying to impress that she maybe had more of the leadership gifts of the two or teaching gifts of the two. God used Priscilla. Verse 6, greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Verse 12, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Uh, in verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me. And that's very interesting. Note that, that Rufus's mother was a mother to Paul, which is very interesting because it says to us this, is that not all women serve God in the same way. You have women who are teaching and you have women uh, who are financing uh, ministry, but also you have a woman over here who is being a mother to Paul. And ladies, please understand that here at Woodside, that you don't have to be like somebody else. You're called to be who God has made you to be. What are your gifts and your talents? And some of you here, you serve uh, in the kitchen, and you sense that God uses you there, and you are just amazing at it. And behind the scenes, you're just always making meals for people. That's great. Other of you, uh, you have the gift of decoration, and you can decorate. You should have your own show, Love It or List It, Elmira. And uh, you're great, and God is using you there. Others uh, of women here, you have the gift of teaching and leading. Other of you, you have the gift of administration. So there's not one set um, role for a biblical woman. So what is God calling you to? And so Rufus's mother had a particular calling, just to be a mother to Paul. Now, that was the early church. Now, when we come to Woodside here, we say women are equal in position, but they're also equal in gifting. And so we want to lift up and empower women to serve here at Woodside. But for all the women at Woodside, we want you to serve according to your gifts and abilities. And I would like to highlight one passage that Paul... um, where Paul speaks to that, and in Romans chapter chapter 12, verses 4 through 8, we read these words, a familiar passage of Scripture where Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. And he says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And Paul here, of course, is sharing some of the spiritual gifts. But notice here, and as well in his letter to the church at Ephesus and the church at Corinth, that there are not gifts that are just for men. Paul nowhere says that some of these gifts are for men only. 
And this is an important point, that God gives to women every spiritual gift that he gives to men. So some women are gifted to lead, and some are gifted to teach, and some are gifted to help and serve behind the scenes, and many different gifts. Now, having said that, let me just talk to you just for a moment about kind of the discussion in the Christian community in the Christian church. There are some churches, when they look at all of Scripture, they would say that there's no distinct role for, uh, between a man and a woman, that men, uh, women and men, they can serve in any role in the home and in the church. And so there are some that would hold to that. There are other churches that would say that we believe that God gives men and women the same, but that there is a distinct role for a man in the home and a man in the church. And that's where Woodside, we have landed and uh, you, you know, doing the work of trying to interpret all of the scriptures. So we would say that in the role of elder or uh, pastor elder or senior pastor elder, that that is for men only. But having said that, we at this church are to empower women with the gift of leading and teaching. And there are women in churches just like Woodside who would say, they see God's design, and they would say, that design is for the benefit of everyone. We see that as pro-woman, and they're serving in churches like Woodside using their gifts. So wherever you are in the Christian community, because we have a, a few different views in here, wherever you are, women are to be valued and empowered to serve. I like the way uh, that... Uh, Carolyn Custis James uh, says, uh, this kind of is a summary of what we've been talking about this morning. She, she says this, the community of God's people should be the epicenter of human flourishing. So true. Where men and women are encouraged and supported in their efforts to develop and use the gifts God has given them wherever he stations them in his world. God never envisioned a world where his image bearers would do life in low gear or be encouraged to hold back, especially when suffering is rampant, people are lost, and there is so much kingdom work to do. He wants his daughters to thrive, mature, gain wisdom, hone their gifts, and contribute to his vast purposes in our world. God created his desire, daughters to be kingdom builders, to pay attention to what is happening around us, to take action and contribute. And to all of the ladies this morning, and this is our message to this world that is so broken, Here's the message for our ladies this morning. Jesus loves you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have value and worth, and you are equal to a man. But as well, you are called, you are gifted, you belong, you matter, and you are needed to advance the kingdom of God. And so, ladies, I want to ask you, do you know your calling? God has a calling on your life. And sometimes that calling changes with a different season of your life. But all of you ladies, old or young, single, married, divorced, wherever you find yourself today, God has a calling on your life. And if you're not sure what that is, one way you can better try to understand is through prayer. And God, you know, where would you have me serve? What am I good at? Where are my passions and, and my burdens? And you're trying to put those together. And God, you know, where would you have me serve? And also the Christian community is to be a place where we work together and we point out, man, you are really good at that. Have you ever thought of this? Or, man, I just see your heart beat a lot faster for that cause. Maybe you should consider this. And we're to be speaking into each other's lives, trying to articulate uh, just how God might use a woman. And then, of course, you can take what's called the spiritual gift inventory uh, back in, or in the fall. Um, we will, again, uh, in the new ministry year, offer a spiritual gifts class and encourage you to take that. More than one person has said that that class has helped them to, to better understand their gift, and, and, and so they were able to then emphasize that gift and use it more to the glory of God. So in Scripture today, we see that God uses women. And I was reminded of this this week that when we tell our stories uh, of what God is doing in our world, we need to talk about Abraham and Moses and David, but we also need to talk about Miriam and Deborah and Hannah and Ruth. We need to talk about Peter and James and John, but we need to also talk about Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and Mary and Martha and all the other Marys that God used during that time. And then when we talk about Paul and Silas and Timothy, we need to talk about Lydia 
and Priscilla and Mary. And then when we talk about, you know, as we go through church history, we talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther and Charles Spurgeon. We also need to talk about Amy Carmichael and, and uh, Harriet Tubman. And is there a third woman that God used somewhere in history? There's a third woman there somewhere. Um, who, uh, anyway, sorry? Elizabeth Elliot, there you go. Corey Ten Boom, another one, great. Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> stop there. What do you think, God uses women more than men? Okay. Um, so that's God's vision for us at Woodside as we move forward together that we lift up women, they are just as valuable, but they are just as gifted, and we need them to serve here at our church and around our world. I want to, in just a moment, call up someone, so that you, a woman, uh, that you could just hear a little of her story and how God is using her, but I just want to highlight just a few others as well. You heard this morning about Sarah Van Veen, how God called her to help work at the Pregnancy Center and a, a wonderful ministry. Uh, Miriam Hill, as well, has been called uh, to that ministry. Another lady in our church that's working with refugees is Corrine Shu, and uh, she's working with what's called Open Homes Ministry. I think it was started in Waterloo, uh, but uh, it's in partnership with the Mennonite Coalition for um, Refugee Support. And um, I was asking Corrine, I said, how did you get involved in there? Because she does a lot of things in the church. And I said, how did you get involved uh, with, this, with this refugee ministry? And she said that in 2015, there was a family that came over from Colombia, and uh, she just saw uh, this, this Colombian family uh, seeking refugee status, all the help that they needed. They needed legal help. They needed medical help. They needed help with uh, paperwork and uh, filling out assessments. They needed to learn how to use the bus system and get groceries and English as a second language. And uh, by the way, we are presently working on a third missionary family, bringing them over to Canada. And, but with the last two, God has used some of you to rally around those, those uh, ones we've brought over as well. But God is using now Kareen uh, to work with another family, um, a Colombian family. And I said to her, well, how did you know it was that ministry and not another ministry? And she said, well, in my time when I pray to God, um, uh, in, my, in my time alone with God, she said, I was just praying and I'm always trying to listen for the still small voice of God. And she said, it seemed to me that God had placed this right in front of me and said, Kareem, because of the season in your life, I, I really think I want, I, you know, I want you there. And not just to help them, but I want to teach you some things. And when she said that, I thought, how true is that? Then when we step out to serve in the name of Christ, and sometimes we have to take a risk and move out of our comfort zone, it's there that God can shape us and mold us and stretch us so that we do grow in our faith with Jesus. And so God is using uh, Corinne Chu to reach out to Colombian families. Now, having said that, um, God is using Katie Martin uh, to speak into the lives of Colombians as well. So I'd like to invite Katie Martin uh, at this time. And I just wanted to ask her, before we close, just a few questions. Great. And again, Katie, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And uh, before I ask uh, Katie some questions, I just want to uh, share with you, if you don't know who Katie is, just a little bit of her story. Uh, she right now is going back in just a few weeks to Columbia, and uh, she serves there as the uh, Bible teacher and co-chaplain at the L... Camino Academy uh, in Bogota, Colombia, which is an international Christian high school? Yep, K to 12. K to 12, okay. And uh, so God is using her uh, there, and she's going back for her third year. But just a little backstory to that. Uh, Katie grew up here at Woodside, and uh, in time, helped out in her children's ministry, helped out in her youth ministry, and in particular, I got to witness uh, just how she built into the lives of so many young girls and uh, we applaud you for that, Katie. That was wonderful. Uh, she also went to Zambia, uh, to a, a, a partnership that we have in Zambia. Also went to Ecuador, partnership we have in Ecuador, and then as well to Botswana on these different missions trips. But now God has called you to Colombia. So I guess the first question, Katie, is how did you decide uh, after high school and university to go to Colombia? And especially with many young people wondering, you know, where do you want me, God, and what do you want me to do? Could you speak to that? Sure. I just want to start by saying thank you, um, Dan, and also just the Woodside community for continuing to love and support me, even with the distance between us now. Um, I love coming home here and spending time with you guys. And I know it's been a long service, and you're tired of sitting. 
but please engage with me for five more minutes because I want this to be uh, mutually a blessing to, to both of us. Um, to the young people who are in the decision-making process or to anyone in that stage of life, I guess, um, my small advice would be just what Dan has been saying. Do you know yourself? Do you know what you're passionate about? Do you know what burdens you? Um, and for me, the way that I learned those things was putting myself in as many uh, serving opportunities as I could. And in each serving opportunity, I experienced different pressures that helped me realize what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were, what I was passionate about and what um, made me tick. And so taking all of that information was an active process. We need to be active in reflecting on uh, those experiences in our lives to help us know how God wants us to move forward. And so that's what I did as I was making this decision to go to Columbia. I was thinking back on my time as a youth intern here at Woodside, where I realized that I really have a passion for working with high schoolers. Um, my time at university, I lived with international students, and my, my time overseas on short-term trips just helped me confirm that uh, just how much I love crossing those cultural boundaries. Um, and doing other jobs like working at the creative communications team with Power to Change and being a director of a Christian sports camp in Guelph helped me realize that I love the development piece of a job and especially when that development is connected to people's spiritual growth. And so when this opportunity came up to work at a Christian international school uh, with high schoolers doing that spiritual development piece um, overseas, it was just like God saying, here's where all of those passions can meet. And it was just then praying for the courage to be able to step out and, and do that. Awesome. And Katie, you've done it now for two years. You're going back for your third. Uh, could you share uh, just a story or two how you've seen God working uh, over in Columbia? Yeah, so there's so much to share, um, but only a short time. So come find me later if you want to hear more. But I'd like to start with the vision statement for the school because I think it just sums things up nicely. Um, it's El Camino Academy is a Christ-centered educational community biblically equipping bilingual servant leaders to transform their world. And I'm proud to say that in my two years at this school, um, I've seen this vision being fulfilled in many different ways. The teachers work very hard to integrate a biblical worldview into all of their subjects. Um, myself being a part of the spiritual development piece, um, we do a lot of activities like chapel and small groups and retreats and mission trips with these students. And so we're doing everything we can, one-on-one -on -one discipleship, to um, build them up as Christ-centered leaders. And they're not only getting a bilingual education, but they're also getting a bicultural education with a mix of Colombian and American staff. Um, when they graduate, they receive both an American and a Colombian diploma. So. Uh, these kids are not needy. They are very, like, they're not poor. They're very privileged. And uh, the school sees this as a unique opportunity to, uh, to transform the world because they're going out and becoming leaders in Colombia and around the world and hopefully impacting those places in Christ's name. All of that being said, though, um, like we heard earlier this morning, brokenness exists everywhere. Um, it exists in each of us, and it exists all around the world, and it exists in this Christian community, too. And so, um, as you guys think about me this next year, I would love prayer for um, just the emotional, spiritual burden that I carry for these 90 high schoolers. Um, they are dealing with all of the same issues we have here, mental illness, financial troubles, um, hostility towards the gospel, even. Um, they have the doubts and fears that all young people have when they're stepping out in their faith. Um, so, yeah, I need prayer for that. All the staff need prayer for that. Um, but God is faithful, and it has been really encouraging for me to see how God has used things like grief and pain and illness to bring a deeper devotion and more authentic faith in these students' lives. I've had the privilege in the past two years of uh, leading three students already to Christ, and. There are a couple more that are really on my heart this last year, and I, I feel like God is um, just doing amazing things in this group. That's awesome, Katie. And uh, quickly, uh, not quickly, take your time, you're doing great. Um, ne what do you think God has next for you after um, your third term at, at the school? Yeah, so 
Um, as I've reflected on this job experience now, I've realized that I have a stronger desire to heal uh, than my desire to teach. And so currently I'm applying to grad studies in clinical mental health counseling. And my prayer is to use those new, school, uh, those new skills to um, be a part of building healthy communities for the, to the glory of Christ wherever in the world, wherever God wants to take me next. So you can pray for that. <laughs> Great. And then finally, um, last thing, um, what would you say to, or would you like to say something to, in particular, the women um, and the younger women of this church? Yeah, um, I'll just start by saying that not, obviously not everybody is called by God to be a cross-cultural missionary in the traditional sense, but all of us as Christians are called to be on mission uh, for God's kingdom. And so, just repeating what Dan has already said, do you know your calling? Do you know your passions and your burdens? Do you know the uniqueness that God has built in you um, for his kingdom purposes? And specifically for the women in the room, I just wanna encourage all of you, and um, I'm in this as well, that we are image bearers um, of God as much as men are. And, the minds and the hearts and the strengths that God has given us give the world a unique glimpse of God that has to be seen. And so I want to encourage all of us to continue to pursue um, those passions and those, and those burdens that we have to the full uh, for our pleasure and for God's glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Would you join with me in thanking Katie? That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please stand with me as we pray for Katie? And, and I want to pray, too, for all the women here at Woodside. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for Katie Martin, Lord God, and the work you are doing in her life. Thank you for her as an example of someone who wants to be used of you wherever she is. And uh, Father, she goes back to school. We pray that you will just work things out for her, bring the details all together. We pray that at the school in her third term there, you will keep her safe. And Lord, we thank you through the ups and downs of serving that you have been her strength and her joy. And I, we pray as she goes back and is reaching out to all of these uh, students, Lord, that you would continue to be her strength and her joy. And Lord, we pray too for her future that you will continue to guide her in the way that you would have her go. So thank you for her. We commit her to you. And Lord, we pray for all the women here in our church, Lord, that you will help them to embrace the reality that they are loved by you. They are equal to men. And as well, Lord, that you have gifted them, you've called them to serve you. And Lord, help them with that as well. To the praise and the glory of your son, Jesus, we pray this. Amen.